Good. Um, my name is Nadja Nels. I'm a medical student um, from the Technical University um, of Munich, and I'm currently in my final year. Um, and um, present a short case report of a patient of ours um, with congenital Ewing sarcoma. And starting with the medical history, uh, uh, in the 32nd week of pregnancy, a fetal mass of the small pelvis was detected um, during ultrasound as a part of prenatal screening, which had a compressive effect on the surrounding soft tissue. Um, the preterm newborn was delivered um, via normal vaginal birth and in the 34th week of pregnancy. And the postnatal examination showed again a massive compression symptomatic, including um, bilateral urinary obstruction, grade three to four, and tumor related uh, me uh, mechanical sub alias. Um, a postnatal MRI scan um, confirmed a large retrovesical mass, um, which can be seen here on the right, uh, for the left picture, um, and uh, bilateral hydronephrosis due to the compression um, of the tumor as seen on the right. Um, an additional sagittal plane of the contrast enhanced MRI can be seen on the right, showing um, a presacral um, mass um, here. Uh, reaching the mid-abdomen with a heterogeneous internal structure, uh, partly solid and partly cystic. Based on the morphology and the location of the tumor, uh, the tumor was considered to be a, sacro uh, a sacrocogial teratoma. Um, in combination with um, this and the compression symptoms, the indication for surgical uh, resection of the tumor was given. Um, during the surgery, infiltration of the um, sigmoid colon and um, the ureters were found, uh, and the tumor showed extensive necrotic and liquefied um, changes, and unfortunately collapsed into the abdominal cavity. Um, histopathology then revealed a small round blue cell tumor with immunohistochemical um, positivity for CD99, and um, RNA panel sequencing then detected EWS fly one gene fusion, um, further solidifying the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. Um, sorry. Um, after tumor resection, a modified chemotherapy with a dosage adaption, according to Ewing 2008, uh, was started in consultation with the cooperative Ewing's um, sarcoma study in Essen. Um, the chemotherapy protocol was analog to VIDA, except um, cyclophosphamide was uh, used instead of ifosfamide, and etoposide was added after the corrected age of three months. Um, lastly, the, dos the dosage was further um, reduced to 75% as an attempt to uh, reduce uh, chemotoxicity in neonates. Unfortunately, a pre-chemotherapy ultrasound uh, revealed new cystic lesions throughout the abdominal cavity, as, an, um, as can be seen here on the right. Um, to further differentiate the lesions, additional ultrasound um, was performed every two weeks, showing initial size reduction for most of the lesions. Uh, however, after six chemotherapy cycles, uh, the new lesions appeared, um, indicating tumor progress. Metastases of Ewing sarcoma were finally confirmed um, by laparoscopic resection. Due to the progression of the tumor during initial therapy, the poor prognosis, and after a consultation with the parents, further therapy except for uh, supportive measures was discontinued. The child died at the age of 10 months. Um, to summarize, this case um, underlines the importance of recognizing congenital Ewing sarcoma as a rare, but as a crucial differential um, of prenatal tumors. The current therapy options um, are limited by missing information and a lack of experience. Use chemotherapy regi uh, regimens are um, derived from standardized protocols. 
Um, however, only a few neonates uh, tolerate this intensive therapy. And lastly, uh, reported cases of congenital Ewing sarcoma show a drastically reduced survival in comparison to the adolescent's counterpart, um, with most of the reported cases dying in a time span of maximum three years. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening, and especially Uta Dirksen, uh, Uwe Thiel, and uh, Irene Teichert von Lüttichau for giving me the opportunity to present this case. Thank you. Um, shall I just uh, go on with the next case? Um, I have to say it was, I mean, this is sometimes just by chance, but last year we had really extremely few, uh, common reports on very, very small children um, with Ewing sarcoma. And, and we had also one in Essen, and though this is the, the second case here. It is uh, kind of, uh, similar story. It was uh, it was it's a male child um, and was uh, spontaneous delivered in a 36 week of pregnancy, and um, the tumor was not recognized prior to birth. Um, but uh, after that, the marked swelling of the rest uh, left thoracic wall was uh, noticed, and um, the child was. Um, admitted to our hospital in um, day five of his life and so uh, we did an MRI and found a mass of the left thoracic wall um, 6.4 uh, to 5.3 uh, centimeters. Uh, we did a whole body MRI and showed um, and found no other metastatic lesions. Uh, we checked uh, for catecholamines of course this was negative and the child was uh, all in all in a quite good general condition. Um, uh, we did a biopsy and um, uh, thanks to Hus for uh, giving me these um, slides. Um, so you can see on the right a typical small blue uh, round cell tumor um, the, and uh, on the bottom you can see here that the tumor is really 100% uh, CD99 positive. Uh, there was a nuclear expression of fly one. Uh, the tumor was INI positive and uh, this is maybe due because uh, the child was so young the key uh, 67 was 90% but this is what we always see in in uh, pediatric malignancies at very young age that they are proliferating higher than a uh, tumor would do in, an, uh, in another um, age uh, panel. We did a fish, uh, it was negative for EWS fly one and an RNA seq panels uh, detected EWS RN ETB4, which is believed to be, um, yeah, uh, behave similar to Ewing sarcoma from all which that we know from this pus translocations. Um, the patient received chemotherapy. We started with doxomono in the first days where we did not really know what tumor we have. And then we continued uh, to use uh, VCDE and uh, did not uh, uh, provide iphosphamide uh, because of the immature kidneys. Um, the restaging, as you can see here on the MRI, showed a really remarkable, um, very good um, response. Um, the tumor was resected by our sarcoma surgery team. Uh, we had a very good response with only um, um, this very small uh, lesion of uh, about one centimeter. You can see it here, a vital tumor cell left. Uh, the margins were not uh, really wide um, and we had some discussion in our tumor board, but considering the age of the child, we decided not to provide add-on radiotherapy. 
And uh, the child is currently just prior to the last and final VI course. And in the, in the adjuvant chemotherapy, we added iphosphamide. Um, the treatment was extremely well tolerated in, 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 in this young man. And uh, it's an active um, toddler and uh, well developed and reached all milestones. Um, uh, I did have a look in the literature, and and this is but uh, this is, however, only um, a, a small um, part of what is published um, on uh, neonatal Ewing sarcoma. And um, as we heard before, um, most of the patients uh, had a really um, a poor outcome. And the problem in this bunch of literature is that in most of the patients, uh, no translocation was really uh, confirmed so that I think we do not know whether this is really Ewing sarcoma. Um, however, we had some cases uh, published uh, where um, the translocation was uh, looked at. And um, uh, the second patient uh, was a patient from Turkey and they had just, the diagnosis took so long and they started only at day 30 with, wanted to start with chemotherapy, but it was kind of too late. So um, I think um, an important message is really to, uh, to start kind of early also with um, systemic treatment. And I mean, at least from also the patients with uh, AML and ALL and neuroblastoma where we have really often very young children, um, we should know how, how to do this. And um, we would be very interested um, to kind of uh, get internationally data together um, to reanalyze this, this cohort of patients. And in Germany, we had last year four, four children in that age, which was, um, yeah, also new for me. Okay, thanks to the attention. And I think we can, I hand over to our chair lady. Thank you. So um, I we can uh, start the next section. I um, have to thank uh, um, uh, Uta and the, the all the organization for this amazing uh, uh, meeting. I was impressed uh, not only from the quality of uh, the international speakers, but also from the uh, possibility to see the unique uh, uh, um, evolution of uh, Ewing sarcoma treatment to the words of Dr. Jurgens, Dr. Kraft, and Dr. Meyer. So that, many thanks uh, for that. And uh, there are no questions on these uh, two cases I see from the chat. So you can uh, launch uh, in the next uh, section, which is, uh, of course, uh, in uh, um, fundamental for the treatment of patients with Ewing. So the um, well known uh, adolescent and young adults. Uh, group and I'm glad that we will see the perspective of uh, different countries from Germany, the UK, France, Italy, and the uh, last patient perspective. At the end, we'll also have the uh, elderly point of view. Yeah, I think that the Ewing sarcoma uh, as uh, Ewing itself and Dr. Jurgens uh, underscore that with a multidisciplinary and multi-treatment approach, which um, age uh, might also might be um, put uh, jeopardized sometimes in terms of quality of life so I'm uh, willing to to learn from our speakers so I'll give the uh, the talk to Dr. Stefan Freudlin, Stefan Pister and Anon Green and Uta Dirsen from the Germany Sarcoma Group with the lecture Iris Aya. Yeah, Stefan, uh, who wanted to give this talk and would have liked to be uh, here on floor, has no voice today, so he just has sent me his slides. Okay. And I will try. We, 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 I, 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 I think try will... my my very best. Yeah, um, I think you will be great. Then. Yeah. To willing to learn. 
Um, yeah, so uh, what, we, what we thought uh, would be interesting to share is uh, really a, a new research um, consortium called Heroes AYA. Um, and here we want to look uh, into the biology or difference in, in biology and uh, fusion um, positive tumors um, of the AYA age. And um, it's a consortium funded um, by our federal ministry of uh, research and so on, and includes a lot of disciplines, so biology, biochemistry, bioinformatics, data science, oncologists, surgeons, uh, radiologists, pathologists, and translational researchers, and last but not least, a large patient advocacy group, and uh, uh, will be conducted in the sites that you can see here on, on the German map. And um, uh, why uh, did we choose that topic in a core where it comes to tumor heterogeneity? Uh, we believe that from a biological perspective, fusion-driven bone and soft tissue sarcomas represent um, ideal models to explore um, fundamental principles of uh, genetic and also non-genetic intratumoral um, heterogeneity. Um, and we think that it's an advantage that they have that tumor driver and are uh, on another way uh, genetically uh, silent and have not so much mutations. And uh, we think that these features provide a unique um, opportunity uh, to track individual tumor cell clones um, and catch, capture like multiple layers um, of intratumor heterogeneity um, and the interplay and dynamics uh, with the micro environment. And we hope uh, that we get a broad understanding of intratumor heterogeneity treatment resistance um, in this uh, sarcomas, which is especially important in the metastatic patients as we have heard uh, on the last day, like yesterday. And uh, there's an unmet uh, clinical need in bone and soft tissue sarcomas uh, in, in the adolescence group, um, as shown here exemplary by uh, the work of uh, Jenny Walsh, um, where she had shown uh, that patients above 15 years have, have a worse outcome than younger patients. Similar data have been shown by um, the CWS, EBSSG, and uh, American studies. Um, and uh, we have, at least in the metastatic session uh, um, situation, only a few effective therapies, uh, paucity of targetable uh, alterations, and lack of uh, clinical uh, trials uh, with new agents. These are problems we discussed uh, yesterday in, in intensively. And in the AYA setting, we have uh, another problem. We believe that it's a vulnerable and underserved patient population. And uh, at least in sarcoma, there was no improvement in survival for um, decades. Um, uh, they are rarely treated in early phase clinical trials and phase long-term and late effects sequela, which we will hear by Gavi also. So what we aim to do is to gain a paradigmatic understanding of infratumoral heterogeneity close caused by uh, clonal evolutions and or transcriptomic or epigenetic plasticity and to exploit really insights and diagnosis and therapy and capture through all our work packages that I will show in a minute, multiple dimensions of uh, intratumor heterogeneity and its dynamics over the time. Um, and we hope to undercover um, mechanisms driving the diversity of the tumors uh, and also look into the micro environment and the crosstalks here. And so uh, we hope uh, that we can develop approaches for mechanism based therapeutic interventions and uh, um, 
establish a framework for clinical trials dedicated to that age group. And of course, we will share knowledge with the scientific community and engage patients as research partners. And these are like um, the work packages uh, and the groups involved. So it's the cooperative viewing sarcoma study group, CVS group, uh, the adults uh, sarcoma um, registry in form and master. And uh, we have a lot of work packages and I would just jump through them. We have one led by Stefan. Kuhling and Natalie Jäger on genomic and epigenomic uh, characterization. Um, and uh, they will do like the a com comprehensive uh, genomic uh, workup on all these uh, tumors and collaborate with other work packages to integrate um, their data. And um, and this shows uh, preliminary uh, uh, single cell DNA seq data, just so showing um, that this uh, is feasible in this consortium. And we really hope to uh, detect here uh, subclonal um, issues and tumor heterogeneity from our patients. Um, the next work package is on transcriptomic and uh, proteomic um, characterization. And um, that is uh, led by Stefanie Heinzelmeier and Simon Haas um, that uh, will yeah, look just on, on, on the other level, transcriptome and, and proteome. Um, and we will merge in the end these data together. And um, uh, Christian Peitler and uh, Heinz Schlemmer work on liquid biopsy. They will mainly focus uh, on the rapto uh, myosarcoma part here because the Ewing sarcoma part is uh, done as we heard yesterday by uh, Marcus and um, Eleni. And uh, this work package also includes a multi-model imaging uh, project uh, where we aim at detecting metabolic and functional heterogeneity by artificial intelligence with a very smart group of uh, uh, radiologists and um, AI people. Yeah, then we have data science by Moritz Gerstung. Um, who is now in Heidelberg, was before at Cambridge, and Anna Putt uh, uh, to measure and bring all these data um, together and integrate uh, all the data to uh, draw a conclusion from um, the work that is done in the other work packages. Um, and um, Anna Banito and Claudia Bell uh, will work uh, on the functional characterization and validating. So this is modeling of the disease with, uh, with different models, uh, short-term culture, long-term culture, 3D culture models, organoids, and of course, uh, xenografts. Um, and they will validate uh, findings from the other work packages in these models um, to uh, last, not least, uh, um, hopefully integrate um, the findings in the cl clinical implementation work package, where we will use the rolling two design um, to test uh, new agents, new, new drugs, use new biomarkers for at least one uh, phase one trial in this AYA group. And uh, last not least, we have a patient's uh, group uh, uh, involved here and some of the faces are already quite well known. So it's uh, from the SPAN and uh, German Sarcoma Foundation and uh, Yasmin is in and also um, Katja Stiglitz. Um, and uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to their uh, well appreciated inputs. Um, they are involved in all work packages and will guide the whole consortium. And um, yeah, we are very much looking forward to start working uh, with uh, in, in this, this group. And uh, we hope um, that through this really 
multi-disciplinary um, um, and multi-technical approach, uh, we uh, will gain more knowledge in, in, in the cancer of this difficult age group, especially in patients with metastatic and relapse disease. Yeah, and I thank you. And, and this is the, the group who is involved here. Thank you, Uta. I think it's uh, fantastic to, to have all the, these resources uh, uh, to the specific age group, which, uh, as you underscore, it's very um, poses a special challenges. Yes, and uh, from the chat also, Dr. Stefan Burdak, congratulations for your job. Uh, so, uh, if there I are... Like to set up that consortium for quite some decades. Yeah, in fact, that was my question. How much did it take? And um, yeah, of course, it will span on the major uh, uh, frequent uh, diseases in that uh, at, at, uh, age, and I think that... Uh, that's also important to, um, to have a maybe genomic informed approaches that span through uh, diseases that might help you. So if uh, there are no other uh, questions from the chat, uh, I, will, uh, um, I will invite uh, Dr. Dan Stark from UK. It's um, uh, and the representative of, of uh, teenage and young adults at SEOP and is a Professor of Teenage and Young Adults uh, um, in uh, uh, UK, so I'm Leeds, uh, University of Leeds. So, and I think uh, yeah, we have a recorded uh, 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 speech from from Dr. Stark. Please go. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for asking me to speak at the uh, Ewing's meeting today. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person. It's a very difficult time for me at this time. My name's Dan, Dan Stark. I'm a teenage and young adult cancer researcher and a consultant in adult medical oncology in a very large organisation providing specialist, regional specialist cancer care across the north of England and the current chair of the European Network for Teenagers and Young Adults with Cancer. As you all know, Adolescents and young adults with cancer, which are patients aged from around 13 to their late 30s, have very specific medical needs. They present with different symptoms through different pathways. Their cancer types are specific. The adverse effects of their treatments are specific. They have very detailed supportive care challenges, balancing the needs of the individual, the family and the peer group. And they have very specific personal needs around their development, moving from childhood to a mature adulthood but also providing services to young people of this group with cancer cuts across our distinct agencies. Not only is it multidisciplinary in the sense you might understand involving nurses and rehabilitators, specialists and social workers, doctors and all of this, but also it cuts across site specific clinical teams, breast cancer, sarcoma, lymphoma, and across administrative boundaries in healthcare systems, hematology and oncology, adult and paediatric. So it's a complex exercise. The problem is that adolescents and young adults developing cancer have inequitable access to specialist services that can provide both the expert cancer care they need for the range of cancers they get and consider their unique needs. Look at that complex psychological, social and financial impact I mentioned before. Ewing sarcoma is of course one of the cancers that this young group get, um, as do young children get it and somewhat older adults get it rarely as well. So it's highly relevant to talk about teenagers and young adults alongside a um, Ewing's meeting. But these, this inequity in access to specialist services looks increasingly like it really matters. It can affect key cancer outcomes, such as the chance of living five years. The chance of living five years after adolescence and young adult cancer was static when we had no specialisation in centres that could provide both expert cancer care and consider the unique needs of, unique needs of AYA. But they've improved where these services have come into place. And uh, health services research in the UK, in North America, in Australia and elsewhere have begun to see the specialisation uh, that comes about uh, comes about from providing these specialised services is inherent to providing those improvements in overall survival. A young person of this sort developing cancer has to balance a complex world, the world of friends and family, the world of career, 
their spiritual life, their education, their developing romantic life, their wish to have fun and their health. They may lose each of these different things through developing their cancer. And because of health is just one part of a complex life has lived, adolescents and young adults may be simply unable or unwilling to drop all these other parts of their life and travel long distances to manage their cancer quickly. And they can't pragmatically in most restrictions be enforced by law to do so or picked up by a parent, put in a car seat and taken to the hospital to receive that care and treatment. So the model of care is not the same in teenagers and young adults as it is in smaller children or older adults. Moreover, adolescents and young adults have a unique biology. Their bodies have a unique and developing biology. Their cancers have a unique biology. That's as true of Ewing's and Ewing's like tumors as it is of all these other groups demonstrated here. We're beginning to understand more of that biology through projects such as Spectre AYA, which provided on a pan-European level genomic sequencing for some AYA sarcomas and, and brain tumors to identify what could be achieved from that. Of course, <coughs> of course these are the national some of the national projects <coughs> that are providing genetic and genomic data, including breaking news on the bottom here that in the in England, as of imminently, all newly diagnosed cancers in patients less than 24 will be uh, have available uh, whole genome sequencing at the point of diagnosis, funded through our national health service. We're seeing progress as a result of an increasing amount of this biological research. We're seeing adolescent and young adult specific biology influencing study design in acute investment leukemia, colorectal cancer, breast, brain tubes, moving to intervention based upon this specific biology, but not yet to intervention based upon the specific physiology of the young person's body, outside of some interesting observational work by Gareth Field and others, for example. And we're seeing progress from the science of survivorship, moving towards identifying larger groups of adolescents and young adults who should have early detection techniques for their colorectal cancer due to childhood previous cancer and abdominal radiotherapy or to do their genomic and also the modification, for example, of the Hodgkin's regimens to maintain outcomes whilst maintaining collateral uh, function. We're seeing increases in adolescent and young adult trial accrual now as well. We're seeing this mainly in phase three trials more than in drug development. This began with an observation that there was a problem and then with a framework to understand the nature of that problem, such as the one by Lorna Fern illustrated here. Then we see steps taken to improve successful enrollment taking place in the United States, in, in, in the world, in the acute leukemia and by collaborations between trialist groups in the US. And we see that trial accrual in um, adolescents and young adult leukemia increasing survival. So in this context, you wanted me to tell you about adolescents and young adult international European level initiatives, notably the SIOP AYA, AYA committee, where there are three initiatives going forward at the moment. That SIOP committee, a SIOP ESMO, ESMO collaboration working group and a large widespread European network for teenagers and young adults. The SIOB AYA committee was the driver for a lot of this work in Europe. It was the trailblazer. It wanted to build international links and collaborations. It was strategic. It was direction forming into these other networks. But now there are sessions in many cancer congresses about AYA and there are AYA specific congresses as well. And there are other groups contributing to delivering this and driving this agenda forward, such as bringing AYA issues into the political agenda of the European level. The current activities of SIOP AYA are to run a small number of projects which it meets regularly to, to try to develop the SIOP content for the SIOP annual meeting and to try to bring action points to policymakers. It has international European collaborative membership of its leadership group. The SIOP ESMO AYA working group began under the European Network for Cancer in Children and Adolescents in in around 2015 and its role is to promote educational and awareness of cancer topics specific to AYA and it liaises with other ESMO groups for example policy. It's published a recent position paper, it makes, it makes up sessions at ESMO congresses, it carries out surveys, it provides e-learning modules and it wants to bring action to policymakers but it struggles to do so in a nimble manner. It has membership that's joined between the medical oncology and the paediatric oncology community. 
the, uh, the this is the, the, the publication of the position paper which has for example a statement as to what are the criteria that make a specialist adolescent and young adult cancer environment. Entiac is a different organisation. Its role is to widen ever further the interactions with a range of stakeholders across Europe in, in TYA cancer. It develops projects including healthcare policy, about health service design, about data, research, transition much wider than the other two um, than the other two um, organizations and it's um, and, and it, it needs its multidisciplinary, a truly wide stakeholder to deliver its work. It's published its own position paper, which is much more multi-professional. It's got a survey of healthcare professionals right across the gamut of areas. It's got a survey of the charities and third sector organisations with a stake in adolescent and young adult cancer ongoing. It's contributing to discussions with policymakers and it's got its first grant application in to Horizon Europe, led by the National Cancer Institute, Vinette, if you know her. I lead the leadership group at the moment, which has multi-organisational engagement from uh, medics, nurses, medics of different sorts, hematologists, oncologists, nurses from different backgrounds, service users, carers, um, youth organisations themselves, paediatricians and adult oncology services, and about 300 named members with an interest to receive newsletters and invitations to take part in the work. And TIAC is, has an aspiration to become a very wide ranging exercise. It maybe wants to have affiliation to the national AYA groups in Spain, and Italy and the UK and France and Denmark and Netherlands and Germany and so on. It wants to have direct linkage to um, the whole range of third sector, charitable, non-governmental organisations, stakeholders and young people's organisations and the links which it's got with haematology, paediatric oncology, medical oncology, nursing, bone marrow transplantation, etc. Plus be open to individuals who don't fit into any of those specific shapes and to carry out a wide ranging uh, body of work which requires that scale of collaboration to succeed. So the CIOP AYA group um, has been very successful at what it set out to do. Most of the other work that's arising in TIAC and the ESMO CIOP came about because of initiatives within CIOP. So therefore it's delivered a lot of its current objectives. It's still got work to do, but it's delivered a lot of its current objectives. We're now going into a phase with it, we think, where we'll try to re-energise it for its new purpose try to explore what that new purpose might be in detail, develop it, its own innovative, ambitious, novel, creative projects that can be driven forward at the cutting edge at the CIRP level by an experienced group who've been in this AYA game for a long while, bring stronger and active creative relationships. So we want to set a new strategy, be creative to identify a new chair through an open process, ensure the structure is right for the internal and the external work that this committee does and bring on board the trainees for this, this initiative. If we're going to continue to take the AYA cancer activities forward in an active manner, we need to embed systems that promote frequent real time asynchronous international working networking and innovation. So we need to think about the systems that can do that, IT systems that promote the most difficult parts of these collaborations, service user contribution, inclusion of groups who are otherwise traditionally excluded, um, around language, around culture, around time zone, around all sorts of different things, and IT solutions that promote creativity for a world where we won't only be able to be creative by being in play, pleasant in person. So my key messages are, as you know, TYA are different. We're beginning to progress by having a focus on TYA with cancer to create constructive new policies such as the whole genome sequencing work, to create research momentum around clinical trial accrual and therefore to improve the outcomes. We're beginning to see uh, there are ways forward. They need consensus, they need joined up work, they need imagination and they need hard work. So I'd like the Ewing's community think about joining in with this next phase for the CIOP AYA group to identify a small number of interested named individuals who have the time, energy, capacity, will work with the CIOP AYA group to develop its new strategy and joint Ewing's AYA elements of a new developing, innovative, ambitious, cutting edge work plan. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me today.
<clears throat> so from uh, the sake of time, since we are really behind, I think uh, I will welcome Dr. Lawrence Bruget. Uh, Dr. Lauren Bruget is uh, a professor of uh, pediatrics and head of uh, unit La Montagne at the Institute uh, Curie and also has been uh, working on uh, adolescent and young adults uh, project within uh, the European Society of Pediatric Oncology and I'm glad to welcome uh, this morning. Can you see my, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, please, okay, please put you. in, uh, in uh, full screen mode and we are good. Is it okay for you? No, it's not in full screen. You should touch. Uh, okay. The, oh, perfect. You can start. Is that okay? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. So I'm Dr. Valérie Laurence. I'm from Curie Institute. I'm driving the TYA program in my institution and I am also involved in sarcoma care patients. So the topic was to talk, um, to, to tell you in five minutes, if I understand well, about the French experience in uh, sarcoma patients. So I will do my best. Uh, first of all, what is the sarcoma landscape in France? This is very important to know uh, about uh, IA and sarcoma patient. The sarcoma landscape in France is as two is well established with two sarcoma referral networks uh, labeled by the French Cancer Institute in uh, 2009, with one was a pathological uh, sarcoma reference network with uh, diagnostic review, collegial review, which is called REPS. And the other one is a clinical uh, referral network called NetSARC, launched in 2009, um, focused on soft tissue sarcoma and visceral sarcoma, which at the end of a structuration of the uh, multidisciplinary board, uh, evaluation of the activity, and also including all the patients in a shared database with the pathological network. These two referral networks were complemented with a third one called Resource. Um, which is dedicated to bone sarcoma with a pathological um, uh, field and a clinical field. And these three uh, networks uh, merged together in 2019 in only one national sarcoma network called NetSARC Plus, which with 26 reference centers all over the French territory with a pathological um, network, clinical soft tissue network and bone sarcoma network. All of the reference centers are linked with an with a official INCA French Cancer Institute labeled uh, multidisciplinary board. So every reference sarcoma center has a multitask um, to uh, fulfill with clinical tasks about competence, expertise, uh, multidisciplinary board, uh, mission clinical research, which has a, a pathological uh, double reading platform, molecular biology platform, with a strong involvement in research, um, in clinical uh, research, links with all the projects led by the French Sarcoma Group. And also, um, it's a reference center is a functional center about sarcoma patients and has a strong links also with pediatric oncology uh, community with the aim of including all the pediatric cases in the shared database. So that's the sarcoma, uh, you know, landscape with a very strong missions about governance, assessment, and dissemination of results. What and this um, network has led to two major publications showing that in these national networks, compliance to clinical practice guidelines and relapse-free survivors are significantly better where initial treatment of the patients were guided in pre-therapeutic specialized MDB in the French uh, 
sarcoma network. And it also, it has also shown that surgery in one of the 26 reference centers of the French networks compared to surgery in non-reference centers reduces the risk of relapse and death for the patient by almost 35%. Can you remember a new drug in sarcoma field who has shown this data? I don't think so. So that's the sarcoma landscape. What is about uh, adolescents and young adults in France? Well, we started with local initiative in about 20 years ago, 20 years ago and in 2012, there were two major initiatives uh, on a national level. The first, first one, sorry, was to uh, a grant provided by the National Institute of Cancer with eight projects granted all over the territory with creation of cross-cutting cross clinical teams with both pediatric and medical oncologist or adult hematologist professionals with specific psychosocial program. And you can see the, the map on the left. And this, the same year was created the French national group called GOAJA, which is a multi-professional group of uh, health professionals uh, dedicated to IA cancer care, both from pediatric and adult oncohematology background, with many missions about national network, education, dissemination, and being uh, also um, a key partner for the health authority. And we had some major achievements on this, um, on this field with a national instruction launch, launched in 2016, about, which provide financial and administrative support to improve IA cancer care all over the French territory, which financed, with finance to specific services, uh, supporting regional organization and trying to recognize expert centers about IA expertise. So we have now in France 18 IA dedicated team with three dedicated IA units. We are launching in January in three weeks, a national faculty training about IA with cancer. And we have our first GOAJA research grant in October uh, 2021, which was launched with a 200,000 um, euro. So that's the IA, uh, what has been done on the IA field. What about uh, IA sarcoma? In a very brief, some data as uh, now submitted to publication about the management and outcomes of IA patients in the in this network and we have reviewed all the patients age 15 to 30 years managed in the uh, reference sarcoma national center and in non-national sarcoma center to compare their um, outcomes this was done for patients treated between uh, 2010 and 2017 on what has been shown in this paper, which is submitted for publication, is that compliance to guidelines between IA treated in national center is about 80% for pretreatment biopsy and pretreatment imaging, and is about half of the patient when, non -tre when treated in non-reference centers. For the uh, correct surgery, the um, only 22% of the patient had uh, an adequate uh, R0 uh, margin surgery when treated outside reference center compared to about 60% of the patients when treated in good centers, in the, in the good uh, reference centers. There is no um, significant difference in overall survival yet demonstrated, but we think it's about insufficient, insufficient follow-up. So what can we say about IA and sarcoma in the French experience? Is that there is a good interaction between the French Society of Pediatric Oncology and the French um, sarcoma group under the umbrella of the NETSARC uh, national network. The collaboration between sarcoma specialists from pediatric and adult background has been a, really a very good one in the bone sarcoma and in the Ewing sarcoma uh, field. 
uh, beginning in the 80s through the first line European trial, Eurowind 99 and uh, the other one, driven by the AI epidemiology. In soft tissue sarcoma, it's more challenging, but it's emerging. The good the collaboration is, well, quite good for the moment. And what we have to do is to bring together the AI expertise, as, as, as I have shown you, and the um, sarcoma expertise with merging the two, the two networks for the, pay, for the clinician to uh, talk together, have to trust uh, each other, to have mixed pediatric AI uh, adult uh, multi-tumor board, board, to have continuous discussion and to talk about organization of care and collaborative trials. Well, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bruget. It's uh, really fascinating how this uh, collaborative group uh, um, developed uh, in the interaction over the year, underscoring the need uh, to co cooperation in between adults and young, but also, as you clearly shown, uh, in between uh, uh, society or a national level and pathological uh, level. There are any questions uh, from the chat or from the people? So uh, if not, it's already 12.44 12, uh, and we have also the case and I will give uh, the, um, the, the word to Dr. Uh, Andrea Ferrari. Of course, uh, it's uh, uh, my pleasure because he's uh, from Italy, Istituto, Ortopedico, Istituto Nazionale dei Tumori in Milan. He works there since uh, 1994 and uh, has uh, developed uh, a spe special interest uh, in uh, Young's uh, and um, is the lead, as I said, of uh, the um, European Society for Pediatric Oncology, uh, I, um, uh, I a group. So we will uh, talk about uh, activities with young people, the science beyond the um, fun. I'm glad to hear his talk. And also, yeah, it's here. It's, uh, it, it might uh, pose some question in the chat and it might respond uh, from the hospital. Good morning. I am Andrea Ferrari. I'm a pediatric oncology working in Milan. And I have to start to say that it's a great pleasure to be here to tell you about our activity with young people, the science behind the fund. And I have to thank the organizer for the invitation, but also for this really nice trip. My presentation will be on the smiles and the words of our boys and girls of the Europe Project, the program born 10 years ago for AYA, with the idea to deal not only with our diseases, but with the life of our patients, with the double goals of improving the quality of care, thinking, for example, to the access to clinical protocols, but also improving the quality of life of patients within this particular age group, creating dedicated space and projects. In these years, we have learned a lot from them, and we always wondered how we could respond to the needs of AYA with cancer. But then we've learned that we should ask ourselves if we really know what are their needs. We've learned how it's important to let them be the ones who then ask their needs. And so we have learned that our patients have the need and the right, of course, to receive the best possible treatment. Have the needs to have physician that know that treating adolescents with cancer is very different from treating cancer in adolescents. And I like this figure that show that each young patient is not only their disease, but also their passion, their friends, their family, career, love, and so on. AYA patients have the need of shut their fury, their hunger, but also the need to smile at life. AYA patients have the need to overcome their limits, and to play football with their friends. AYA patients have the need to be serious when this is needed, and the need to be superheroes with super fragilities. The need to think about their future, not only a future related to the date of the next cycle of chemo, and the need to follow their dream. AYA patients have the need to sing their songs, and in this song, they needed to remember the world companions who were lost during the journey. Our patient has the need to protect their privacy, to protect their space, physical and mental, 
They need to search for their happiness and their beauty. And of course, they need to search for love. Uh, and so one of the distinct features of the Youth Project are the creative and artistic activity that over the years involved music, photography, fashion, novel writing, video production, and offer to our patient novel means of expression, and meanwhile giving the medical staff easy access to their AYA patient world. This project were able to achieve various goals. First, they gave our patient opportunity to get together and share the difficult time of their treatment with other young people that were living the same experience. Patients that were receiving treatment together with those that have completed their course of therapy. And this was a great value for both, for the first ones as a positive example to see, for the second ones as a bridge from life during treatment and life after that. So a sort of hideout. This project gave our patients an opportunity to live moments of normality, reminding them that before being a patient with cancer, they are teenagers and find a sense of lightheartedness even in the middle of the hospital course and stays. This project gave them an opportunity to feel important working with professionals in a, such a critical time of their lives when their self-esteem might be deeply damaged. Then the opportunity to regain a sense of future and longer term planning, working on projects expected to take several months. And these are of extreme value since cancer obliges our patients to abandon any plans for future. And we know how their time horizon shrink to the day they will be discharged from the hospital or the day to start the next cycle of therapy and so on. This project gave our patient opportunity to express themselves, to freely voice their feeling or their fears, and we are learning how talking about the diseases of importance in the process of elaborating of the time of cancer diagnosis in order to find the inner resources to answer to the question, why me? And for us as doctors, this project opened a pressure window on the inner world of our young patient to know what they are really thinking and feeling directly from their whole world as a complement of conventional method of providing, for providing psychosocial support. And then the project gave patient opportunity to talk to the community and to mass media. So to be testimonial working side by side with us in program designed to draw attention to the clinical problem of AYA with cancer. And finally, I would like to show how this project became scientific literature with a well-defined methodology aiming to put AYA and their needs under spotlight with the goal to disseminate the model of care to share it within the international scientific community. Each creative project became a scientific paper with the words of our patients and their pictures. And so first, the project of on facial collection 10 years ago on creating beauty, beautiful things based on our own senses, as Elisa said. Then the first project of music, music Cloud of Oxygen, published on JCO, with Eleonora speaking about the clear horizon she sees from a mountain top where she feels the freedom after a time of darkness. The graphic novel Loop, There Is No Going Back, a story about superheroes with them written by our patient who created their own characters and their special powers, like Super Mike, created by Ricardo, that is incredibly strong and recovers Eastern time whenever he's around. Then the photographic project Searching for Happiness, where each patient tried to explain through images what happiness means to him or her, and this, in this particular time in their life and what gave them strength to fight their disease and keep smiling. Then the song Christmas Ball, again music, that became an incredible viral success in Italy with more than 50 million of views on the web. And the song is currently sang in, the, in many Italian schools instead of a classic song as White Christmas or Jingle Bells during the Christmas period. And the project of photography, what shall I do when I go up? A project on the future and on the dreams of our patients. And again, a music a project, the song Summer is You, Rain, Dance in Reverse, when Martina says, we will travel at night so that when you ask me where we are going, I can promise there will be sunshine. Or to Morial, it was a quite complicated project, more than one year of work, to produce a series of video tutorials made by our patients, a kind of survival handbook for the young cancer patients, something like a little trick to survive. Or again, published on Lancet Oncology, the story of another facial collection with short and t-shirt, 
and the design of the new logo of the youth project, youth. For Condomini, where the young patients of the youth project talk about their social isolation, talk about how they can feel lonely even while being surrounded by people who want to give them affection, as Mary told us. Another photo photographic project, looking outside to look within, developed during the pandemic and the lockdown. And more recently, the podcast based on a true story, a project that was based on audio recording and focusing on the theme of the journey, intended as a holiday or an adventure, or also as a metaphor of the cancer experience. With Georgia telling, telling us, I entered the suitcase, I took out all the clothes for dancing, and I feel it instead with strength, hope, patience, courage, and determination, and a lot of pajamas. And I look in the mirror and say to myself, now it is up to you. And finally, the current project of Magic, uh, a project that started with the personalized printing cards made entirely by our young cancer patient, with the kings receiving chemo, the queens wearing bandanas, the jacks dressed as nurses, and the jokers as doctors. And to conclude, I think that we, as doctors, should find a new way of engagement with young people with cancer. Everyone can find easier way. However, I strongly believe that there comes a time when clinical trials are not enough. There are other things, either smiles and laughs, highs brimming with tears, eyes that make contact, silences, or the touch of our hands, or little lies and tremendous truths that we cannot leave to others, like nurses or psychologists, for example. And this is Camilla, that during a big assembly in our institute, in front of 300 physicians and researchers, said, the youth project gave me the opportunity to make a friend of my fears. And we have even had a lot of fun, but we need to understand that this is science. This is science of the soul. And so thank you for the attention. Thank you for the invitation. And this is Martina, the Termana Media, to conclude my speech. So many, th many thank uh, Dr. Ferrari, and uh, I, uh, I think uh, your, uh, your lecture was very, very touching and uh, uh, raising the voices of patients is something uh, uh, priceless. Uh, so many thanks uh, for sharing uh, your experience uh, with all of us. I, I, um, I was wondering uh, if there is um, some uh, attempt also to, to help this, uh, the IA group, uh, especially in Italy from a regulatory point of view, from the work uh, problem. So the, beside uh, having uh, the, the, all the limitation for uh, normal young activity, they should uh, enter the, 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 the to the, the field of the work and I, they cannot. And then I'm asking this because I remember one of our patients surviving after uh, Ewing 13 years. And uh, he also came to his National Tumor, tumor for Pneumonectomy and uh, he undergoes all the experimental treatment uh, pa possibly. And uh, his more, uh, biggest complaint, he has a girlfriend, he has friends, who's a work. So they are, uh, the, the, he had the, the possibility to keep working also after the, 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 the finishing his days because his uh, firm gave him uh, that possibility, of course, on their expenses. And also they received from our uh, president the order of merit of the Italian Republic. So this story was uh, very popular in Italy uh, two years ago. So I wonder if, uh, uh, there are some uh, national efforts to help uh, our patients. Thank you, Manila. You touched a very important point. You, we know that our patients that survive have less possibility to have a good career, to have a family, for example. So this is an important point. Uh, there are nothing on a national level. We are trying to do something in, within the IEOP, the Pediatric Oncology uh, setting, uh, together with a charity to understand okay. directly from our patients if there is something we can do for them. Uh, but this is something that we can try to, to work on uh, on Italian level, on a European level, for example. We know from then that we have in TIAC, we have the ESMO COP group. We have many, uh, many levels where we can try to do something for, for this problem that is a really important problem. 
And Uta or other speakers, do you have a good experience in helping our patients through their working path? Um, yeah, I, I think I also wrote in the chat, I think it's a, it's a, a general problem and it's, but maybe also a multi-layer problem because um, some, uh, <clears throat> it may also differ from country to country, um, but uh, some patients right after the diagnosis uh, still experience this fatigue and so on. And uh, if they are then like one year kind of unemployed, do not start going to university, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult. And uh, we also don't, of course, we have laws and blah, 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 that you have to employ people um, who are, um, yeah, kind of in, with kind of impairments and so on. But in, in fact, it's it's not just not always uh, always done, and especially in the in the young people, we need that there's a need for a lot of lobbying. And um, Andrea, I always admire what you are do <laughs> with JCO papers about music uh, projects, but this is this is important. And I think like publication of all these things and, and bringing all this uh, to, to science is um, is what we need to do to uh, to create uh, a broad audience also concerning. Yeah, in, in front of our politicians. And I think also with this PSYOP E AYA group that we have and and so on, we hope to do some some lobbying here on behalf of our young patients. And I mean, what you said was really also what has been said by the two young uh, ladies uh, to um, this morning, Helena and and uh, Mika. I think they would uh, also join this chorus. I also think that uh, what Valerie showed, this is like the, the other side of approach, but we really need to, to set science on, on all these things to, uh, to create data. Yeah, yeah besides the science, uh, the science, I think uh, that uh, we saw uh, any, uh, a lot of joy and uh, coming from uh, this, yeah. uh, in this kind of uh, t tough lives, uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's already a great uh, achievement. And of course, uh, trying to, be, to make a size of it uh, would uh, increase uh, its visibility and uh, it's very important. So very many thanks. So I, oh, it's one, so we should be uh, over, but uh, we are not. So I will uh, let the patient representative uh, uh, talk uh, since uh, we underscore that uh, is their voice so that uh, it's important, uh, especially in this uh, in this age. But uh, in all uh, the 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 disease journey, I would say. So, so we had a change of program here. There is no patient representative okay. presentation now, but we move directly on to the seniors presentation, please. Okay, so the last uh, presentation, uh, the different uh, perspective, uh, this, uh, this field is uh, super important. I'm very glad to welcome uh, Dr. Silvia Hofer from uh, University Hospital of uh, Zurich, uh, um, uh, treating, as I say, the Ewing sarcoma elderly patient. Um, it's um, the most challenging because uh, combining is essential and combining active treatment combined toxicity. So please, uh, uh, Dr. Hoffler, offer. Thank you, Emanuela. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, you can go. Thank you, and thank you, Uta, for the invitation to this outstanding symposium. On behalf of Beata, Bode and myself, I'm happy to present preliminary results of our small series of elderly Ewing sarcoma patients. While we are celebrating 100 years of Ewing sarcoma progress, I can already tell you that the oldest patients I encountered so far was 90 years old. And yes, it poses new challenges. 
the questions whether there are elderly patients with Ewing sarcoma can be answered with a clear yes. Patients over the age of 50 years at diagnosis account for about 2% of all Ewing sarcoma patients. The question is, is higher age per se a um, prognostic or a risk factor? And this audience knows well the, the clinical prognostic factors. And yes, age is a prognostic factor with poor prognosis with older age. So we know it for the age of more than 15 years, but we are not sure whether this is a linear worsening um, with older age. From the uh, Dirksen, we know from this ASCO meeting that there is an association of unfavorable outcome with those modification and delays in treatments. And I think this is especially relevant in the elderly population. I found this nomogram from a large Chinese database. And here you can see that age below 30 and above 30 years has a big impact on prognosis in this nomogram. However, this nomogram has room for improvement since clinical and molecular parameters are not yet included. So we asked ourselves whether molecular characteristics are different in tumors of the elderly compared to other age groups. For this reason, <clears throat> We were lucky to collaborate with the project of the Ewing Sarcoma Genome Atlas, especially thanks to Thomas Grunewald and Laura Romero Perez, who helped us to analyze our samples. The Ewing Sarcoma Genome Atlas has samples from 715 Ewing Sarcoma patients, and for 24 of those are above the age of 50, samples deriving from Spain, Germany, and Switzerland. Here are the age distributions depicted, and you see a range from 50 to 70 years, 77 years, and a mean age of 64 years. Male and females were equally distributed. The majority had soft tissue Ewing sarcoma, a fact that is well known from the literature in elderly patients. Localization, 65% of the patients had uh, their tumors in the axial region, which again is uh, associated with worse prognosis, whereas 35% had uh, their tumors in the extremities. Most of the patients had localized disease at diagnosis, which is in concordance with a general observation in Ewing sarcoma. This is the pie charts we have seen yesterday from Professor Jurgens. Now, what about the molecular features in elderly patients? Laura provided me two examples of patients who showed a global altered pattern of copy number variations, and one other example of a flat pattern of copy number variations. So, so far there seems to be no common copy number variation patterns in the elderly cohort. Laura did also some RNA sequencing, but due to the small group, there was no statistically sound conclusions so far. We did um, look at the EWSR fusions in our cohort. We had results from half of them, and there were all the classical fusions. So the preliminary results from the project from Laura, we did not find so far any parameter with a unique or characteristic pattern in the elderly Ewing sarcoma patients, but the project is ongoing and comparison with other age groups are planned. 
I would like to share with you some additional clinical data on the Swiss cohort, 20 patients above the age of 51 from five centers over 20 years. Let's start with the patients who are still alive. <clears throat> on, your <clears throat> sorry. on your left, you see the age group 70 to 80 years, 60 to 70 years, 50 to 60 years. Here are the numbers and here are the numbers of patients who are still alive. I would like to point to some patients. This patient is probably cured. She's now 95 years old. She had localized disease on her thorax. She was operated and had radiation therapy, so local therapy only, no systemic treatment. These <clears throat> patients from the 60 to 70 age group survived as well. She had localized disease, but she had the full program with chemotherapy operation followed by chemotherapy. The patients who were disseminated at diagnosis are still with evidence of disease at this standpoint. Now to the patients that has, have passed away, I would like to mention one patient who was 80 years old. She had chemotherapy followed by radiation therapy, survived only four months, and she had her, her tumor, huge tumor in her pelvic region. Another patient in this cohort, he was 66 years old, had disseminated disease and a lot of comorbidities and he died within three weeks without any possibility to give him treatment. Now, to give you a flavor of what chemotherapy regimens were applied, you see here all the classical drug combinations. And when there is an asterisk, there was an abbre abbreviated regimen due to comorbidities. And you see that in all age groups, there were chemotherapies combinations given. One patient in this age group had all, also a high dose chemotherapy and another patient had a second line chemotherapy with an ERI. There were some whoops lesions in the Swiss cohort, namely three out of 20 patients which corresponds well to the 15 to 20% of whoops lesion in the sarcoma patient cohorts in general. When I looked to the literature, I found some articles, publications. Here are the publication years, the authors, numbers in the series, median age, which was much lower than in our cohort. But here you have the age ranges are very impressive and some outcome data which range from 44 percent five-year overall survival to 68 percent in localized tumors that's what we find in the literature to sum up we know there seems to be no age limit in ewing sarcoma which should arise awareness in our cohort 20 patients in 20 years, I think there could be probably much more because we did not a systematical search. Systemic treatment is certainly limited by comorbidities and fitness in the older patients which ask for geriatric assessments. And we don't have data on elderly patients from clinical trials, which were limited to the age of 50. So I think, an international registry is clearly needed to better characterize the disease, to compile clinical data and outcome, tolerability of treatment, and very important patient reported outcome to generate, generate ultimately recommendation for these patients. Tumor samples should be donated to dedicated translational research groups. And yes, an updated prognostic nomogram is desirable. With that, I would like to thank Beata Bode and Laura for their work and my clinical colleagues to give me the data for, from their patients. And thank you all for your attention.
thanks that offer. I really uh, agree on the, your uh, conclusion and suggestion and the prospective res registry which of uh, this ultra rare uh, group uh, uh, that is uh, excluded from each uh, uh, trial um, potentially might be an enclosed, enclosed in a second line trial, but uh, but uh, certainly it's um, excluded by um, frontline uh, treatment for urine sarcoma. So it would be very interesting that you have uh, clinical and uh, tr treatment and translation of data in, uh, in this uh, ultra rare uh, subgroup of uh, urine patients. Many thanks. There are uh, other questions for this, uh, this talk? So, no, so we can- or Maybe uh, just a comment. I mean, we implemented now a Ewing registry also um, in order to be able to include um, patients who are not eligible to be treated in, in the clinical trials and to uh, learn uh, in a kind of structured way. And we were very impressed by these really, a lot of over 80 years old patients um, in, in Switzerland. I think in, in Germany, we did not have um, as many. We have that for soft tissue sarcoma, but maybe yeah. So bone tumors uh, of that age we don't have, and also we are looking uh, to that. And uh, in Ewing, they are, are extra skeletal uh, most. So my um, my fall in the soft tissue sarcoma uh, registry as uh, as well. But uh, that, that will be uh, uh, maybe um, uh, dif difficult to find uh, to share the treatments at that point. So. Maybe some uh, uh, European effort on that uh, specific group is important. <laughs>